very good morning to all of you joining us here this morning. So good to be back in the house of the Lord to bring an offering of praise and worship to Him. If this is your first time joining us, do get in touch with us by giving us a call or sending us an email so that we can help connect you with one of our communities right away. Whether it's in SS2, Subang, Kota Damansara, Puchong and even Kota Kemuning, we are excited and we can't wait to get to know you personally. Today, we'll be partaking the Holy Communion together, so kindly prepare the communion elements for our Holy Communion later right after worship. So come, let us worship our God and King together this morning.
is the biggest, best reason or ever you can use it to rejoice and celebrate. Lord Jesus, we just want to declare this morning, oh Lord, your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name itself is life. Lord, come and minister to our, your children this morning, oh Lord. We just want to speak the name of Jesus into our families, into our own hearts, into this beautiful nation, into our community, into our states, into our government, into our schools. Speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break in Jesus name declaring there is hope and there is freedom hallelujah I speak Jesus your name is power your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. I just want.
within his presence I speak Jesus Okay, dearly beloved, let us prepare our heart to partake of the Holy Communion together and before we do that let me read to us Paul's instruction from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and we will read from verse 23 to verse 26 now it's recorded for us in verse 23 the, the apostle Paul wrote for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you and the Lord Jesus on the same night he was betrayed he took break and when he had given and he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way after, after supper he took the cup chain this cup is a new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord that until he come so dearly beloved as we prepare for our holy communion I would like us to do the following first let's remember our Savior by looking back at what he had done for us and this is recorded for us in verses 24 and 25 we remember Jesus atoning sacrificial that on the cross and the break is meant to remind us of Christ's body that was sacrificed and given for us and the cup is to remind us of the shedding of the blood of Christ we established a new covenant he paid the penalty of our sin not only we remember Jesus atoning sacrificial that on the on the cross we remember his resurrection his resurrection is a seal of approval that that is defeated and sin no longer controls so the resurrection of Jesus Christ does two things it makes our great salvation and it makes our salvation certain second we look forward to his soon coming again and it's recorded for us in verse 26 the the Apostle Paul wrote for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord that until he come therefore we will alter this ordinance until Jesus come so the question is is there a longing in our heart for our Savior to come or are we fearful he might come at any time but in the same verse that we read just now in verse 26 we proclaim Jesus great the salvation to others every time that you and I participate in the Holy Communion we keep proclaiming meaning we keep teaching telling sharing being a witness to the gospel story of Jesus and his love and by our partaking of a piece of bread and drinking a small cup of grape juice we are telling the whole world about God and the beautiful gracious story of the gospel of Jesus the Christ who was sacrificed for us his precious blood that was shed for the remission of sin your mind and everyone therefore into the rest of 2022 let us go and make disciples let's be sure to baptize them signify the Sealing of God Holy Spirit upon their new relationship with Jesus the Christ and let's not forget to teach those we bring into the kingdom to observe all of Jesus instruction so I trust the Holy Communion today remind us of what the Lord has done for us and motivate us to puri purify ourselves as we await His return but more importantly I trust the Holy Communion today remind us of the mandate of the Great Commission to go and make disciples. Shall we pray together? Lord, we thank you for the great 
make available in Jesus Christ for our redemption. And through partaking in the Holy Communion today, we choose to proclaim the Lord that to eat, to share, to testify, and to talk about the salvation in Jesus Christ, the forgiveness available in Jesus Christ for our sin, and the enabling grace of God for our sanctification and our holiness in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. So we come before you. Before the communion table, we thank giving and pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Okay, dearly beloved, the Holy Communion is open to each and everyone who had accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. So let's take a moment to examine our heart as we prepare for the Holy Communion. Let's partake of this Holy Communion in a manner that is pleasing unto the Lord. Let us look inward into our heart in the light of the promise of God we declare that if we confess our sin He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness so let us confess and repent of our sin before we meet at the Lord's table shall we do that for a moment? Our Father, we come to the communion table resting only in the worthiness of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we look at the emblem of our Saviour, death, may we remember why He died, to cleanse, to heal, to sanctify your righteousness and your justice. We remember your great love. May we receive the assurance of forgiveness, eternal life and the hope of glory. And from this table, we look back to the cross on which Jesus died. And we look forward to your soon coming again in glory. So fill us with your power and purposes as we serve you in the world. In Jesus' victorious name. Amen. Amen. May I invite you to hold a break and a cup in your hand and stand together with me, uh, dearly beloved. Uh, dearly beloved, the bread in your hand represent the body of Jesus that was broken for us. So let us partake together in remembrance of Jesus. Dearly beloved, the cup in your hand represent the blood of Jesus that was set on the cross for the forgiveness of our sin. So let us partake together in remembrance of Jesus. Shall we pray together? Father, we thank you for the privilege of the communion today. And from this communion table, we look forward to your soon coming again. We ask that you will fill each one of us with joy and peace in believing that we may continue to abound in the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' most powerful name. Amen. Let us continue in worship by bringing our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we bring our tithes and offerings before you this morning. We know that every blessing comes from you and we want to respond to your love by giving these blessings back to you as part of our worship. We pray that you will continue to use these resources to share your love to this world, even through your church, that the kingdom of Christ will be established here on earth as it is in heaven. So we give you the highest praise this morning. In Jesus' most powerful name we pray. Amen. We are launching our fourth round of happiness group among the CBC group of English churches from 16 October 2022 to 8 January 2023. We hope to see more LifeNet group participating in the happiness group. So, for the next two weeks, the LifeNet small group will organize Arcos event and guest night for two weeks between the 27th to 29th October. Until then, do join us in prayers. CBC is organizing a conference 
Thinking for a Change on 12 November Saturday, 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. at CBC CPAC. This conference is compulsory for all live net small group leaders and assistant leaders. That's all for today. So this morning, we are delighted to welcome Elder Dr. Ong Si Lian to share the Word of God with us. So without any further delay, let us all put our hands together and welcome to the stage, Elder Dr. Ong Si Lian. Good morning, brothers and sisters. For those of you who are joining us on the online service, uh, what a privilege it is to be able to talk to you this morning from the Word of God. We are now at the climax on the book of Ezekiel. Over the past several weeks, we have been looking at the book of Ezekiel to see how God, through His transforming power and His faithfulness, sustained the people of Israel despite their disobedience, and God still cared for them. And today we're going to look on how God would heal this nation and restore to them what He has originally intended. But before we go any further, just do a quick recap what was happening to this nation of Israel. You know, after Solomon the son of David uh, died, there was a revolt and there was a close to a civil war erupted in the kingdom, United Kingdom of Israel. And when God intervened, although the war was averted, the kingdom was divided into two, the northern and the south kingdom. And they have never been able to reunite together. The northern kingdom lasted something like around 210 years and they never had a single king that honoured God and did what was right in the eyes of God. Whereas on the southern kingdom, Judah, they had uh, a total of 20 kings, and out of which only nine that really walked after the Lord. And the kingdom of Judah eventually became so wicked because they got involved with the Canaanites, and literally they have no difference. They have not identified with the people, with the pagan people surrounding them. And so God sent prophets after prophets and those fiery, passionate men of God who spoke boldly and proclaimed the warnings, the judgments of God. And yet we find that they ridiculed them. And some were even killed and persecuted. They make fun of them, revile them. And so God's chosen people who are supposed to hear the message of God's chosen messengers, but they chose to ignore them altogether. And so what? God sent judgment. And God ultimately destroyed Jerusalem around about 570 BC. And while many of them were killed, something like close to 50,000 of them, and some of the Israelites were taken captives to Babylon. And it was during this exile we find that God raised up prophets like Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and the like to continue prophesying against this nation, this rebellious generation of God's chosen people. And when we were looking at the book of Ezekiel, we know that in chapter 1 to 3, we hear the call of God upon Ezekiel. You know, it's quite tough for Ezekiel to hear this call because God is calling him to speak to a bunch of people who are stubborn, stiff-necked. You know, how many of us want to be called prophets of God during that time? And God says, these people will not listen to you. It's Ezekiel, when he heard this call, when God gave him the vision of, uh, of the angelic beings and of the wheels and so on. And Ezekiel, in his mind, God, you must be joking. Why are you calling me to speak to a bunch of people who could not who will not be listening to you. And just uh, last week, we hear that God was asking Ezekiel to prophesy to a valley of dry bones, to people who are already dead. But God had a message. God had a call upon Ezekiel. This is what makes a difference between a person who hears the call of God, that despite the circumstances, Despite whatever obstacles our human minds will tell us, you will still obey, you will still go on, you will still be faithful, doing what God has called you to do. And you don't look at the results sometimes. But God called Ezekiel, and God's word was in him. And through him, God proclaimed the message that he wants his people to hear. And we see here, after God has called, God called him to talk to, the, to prophesy against the destruction of Jerusalem. 
And here we see the downward trend in the lives of the nation of Israel. And God gave them the assurance that this will happen. God's judgment will come. And so in chapter 4 to 24, we see the judgment, the prophecy concerning the judgment of the nation of Judah. And not only the nation surrounding Judah, that God also prophesied the like of Edomites, the, the like of Meomites, and God will proclaim his judgment against this nation in chapter 25 to 32. Yes, some of them pride themselves in their successes, in all their well-being, in, in, in their power. And this is what the world today are also demonstrating itself. And those nations who think that they have the military power or the economic power, they can go around the world and conquer those vulnerable nations and take advantage of the situation, making them to kowtow to them. And the situation during Ezekiel's time is no different from what we are experiencing right now in the 21st century. And so God has a message even for us today. God is going to bring about his judgment. But we see later on in the last section, the last two Sundays, we have seen how God come back and say, I'm going to return to you. Yes, your shepherds have neglected you, taken advantage of you. But I'm going to be your shepherd, the Lord says. And that's why we read in chapter 34. And last Sunday when Ezekiel was called to prophesy to the valley of dry bones, God is showing that he is going to do the new thing. The power of God can be demonstrated to the lives of people who are dry, so long as they are willing to come back and God will breathe a new breath of life into their lives again. And how many of us today, we were so dry, like dead skeletons in our own way. Our spirit can never be alive to the Spirit of God. When God speaks to us, we can't listen and hear the voice of God. But it's not until we submit ourselves to allow the Spirit of God to fill through us again that our lives can be resurrected, be afresh, be refreshed, and to listen to the Word of God again. Today, we're going to see the climax, how God gave Ezekiel this vision of a, of a new temple and also uh, in, into the, there's a water or the river that's going to run through this where life is going to spring up once again. And so today's message is about the vision of hope, a vision that God has given to Ezekiel who lived in exile for more than 25 years in Babylon. And the temple in Jerusalem was already, the physical temple was already devastated. It's in ruins because of their idolatrous sins and and injustice. So God's people is in exile. They were scattered and they were like a flock without a ship and they were living in their own ruined land. And there was therefore no hope. There was no future. Only judgment and destruction. In chapters 8 to 11, Ezekiel saw a series of visions. He saw the abominations in the temple and the glory of the Lord departed from them. From the temple. Now, after both the human and spiritual evil that was defeated, as we see in chapters 38 to 39, chapter 40 to 46, talk about the final temple, the vision that Ezekiel receives, the temple that God will once again put in among them. You know, in contrast to the abominations we see in chapter 8 to 11, we are going to see a vision of the new temple. You know, and as God showed Ezekiel, taking him to see the dimensions in chapter 40 and 42. And suddenly the glory of God is returning to fill up his temple once again, as we read in chapter 43. You know, the temple often speaks about the center of the life of the people of the nation. And God gave them specific instruction to worship God in the temple. Now, Ezekiel's vision does not end with the temple because the city and the land was described in the midst of which there was a new temple and the temple was in the center of their life. And this vision of the temple concludes in chapter 48. It says the Lord is there. The Lord has glory has returned. The Lord is among them again. And so this vision of the new temple gives the hope is in the symbolic way which is also relevant to us today. The new temple speaks about the very center of this new city. 
and we can correlate this to the book of Revelation. Later, I'm going to explain a bit more about the coming of the kingdom. When Jesus comes again, he's going to establish the new kingdom, a new city, a new Jerusalem. And chapters 47 and 48 speaks about the consummation of the human history in a very symbolic way. So today's passage in Ezekiel 47 would describe a very a, a wonderful river that is flowing from the temple, starting from trickle of water, bringing life and healing to the land. And this vision reveals the very heart of God in a broken world and testifies about what the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is going to tell us about. Brothers and sisters, you know that at the very center of God's heart, He wants to give us that river of life that flows to heal the broken hearts and our violent world. And so today I want to speak about experiencing the healing power of God. And there are four parts today. First day, to recognize the source of this river. And secondly, to embrace the power of this river. And thirdly, to witness the transformation that is taking place because of the river. And finally, rejoice because this river brings life and joy. In verses 1 and 2, we read, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. The man means the angel, is an angelic being. And I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple towards the east, for the temple faced east. And the water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, the south side of the altar. And he then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside of the outer gate facing east and the water was trickling from the south side. And so Ezekiel has this vision at the, you know, at the east gate of, of the temple. He saw water ticking down from the threshold, from beneath the door. And so Ezekiel witnessed this amazing sight, water coming out from under that door, coming from the presence of God. The temple is the presence of God. That's where God dwells. And the, the water was trickling. It's not like rushing water. Tickling flows from into the east and passes through the south side of the altar and out into the, <coughs> into the eastern gate. In the Bible, <coughs> the water often speaks about life. It speaks about blessings, showers of blessings. It also speaks about fruitfulness. It reminds me of the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, there was river. And we read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 10, that this river in the center of the garden, a river watering the garden, flowed with, from Eden. And there it was separated into four headwaters. Now it was a place where plants flourishes. And when you see, there was a complete bliss, delight. And there was serenity. It was blessed because God's presence was there. Obviously, this was before Adam and Eve sinned, before the fall. Eden was such a blissful place. And this vision that God has given to Ezekiel is almost like a duplicate of what God intended in the first place, to create like a garden of bliss. And so the vision of this water flowing out from the temple the temple was, a cent, cent, was central to his vision. You know, in the Old Testament, <clears throat> the temple or the tabernacle or the tent of meeting represented the very presence of God among his people. Remember, when they were setting out from Egypt into the promised land, going through the deserts, going through Sinai, God told Moses to build the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and signifying the very presence of God. Significantly, we find the river does not come from the king's palace or from a government building. It does not come from you know, the, the center of the town, a marketplace, or a place of doing business. It comes from the God's tabernacle, God's house. It comes from God himself. And so we find that was what God demonstrating to Ezekiel. God wants to be the center of their lives. No human beings were created 
to enjoy the very presence of God, who is the source of their life and the source of their everything. But because of sin, and in this case, because of Israel, the Israelites breaking their own covenant with God, they were, break, they were driven out of their own homeland. And the temple was destroyed. And Israel has completely failed because of their unfaithfulness and their injustice. And so God's presence departed from them. But Ezekiel once again received this vision of the new temple. The assurance that God will return. The God will not abandon them. God's promise is true. He is faithful to His promises. And this vision of the temple, we know, has been fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. How wonderful it is, we in the New Testament age, we now have the gospel, our Lord Jesus Christ, God, Emmanuel, God, the very Son of God, He became flesh, He came and to dwell with us. Emmanuel speaks about the very presence of God. John 1, 14 says, The Word of God became flesh, and He made His dwelling among us. We have seen the glory of God, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now in Jesus' ministry, He demonstrated His life, and ultimately He went to the cross, shed His blood for us, and Christ Himself became the perfect dwelling place, the temple for you and I. Remember when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, and they were actually misused the, the temple, they were trading and so on. And Jesus told them in John 2 verse 19, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. Now Jesus is saying that he's going to replace this so-called physical temple with himself. This Jesus whom they are going to crucify, he will die for our sin and yet he is going to rise within three days. And he's going to become the new place where everyone may meet with God and have fellowship with God. How wonderful it is when we see this picture of the temple that Jesus says, Within, you can destroy this temple, but I will raise it again in three days. Jesus was speaking about himself, the temple upon which we can now dwell. We don't have to go to a physical temple. We can bring our life to him and allow him to come and dwell within us. Wherever we go, wherever we are, in our home, in our offices, on the road, wherever, the very presence of God can be with us because He is the source of our life. You know, in Revelation chapter 21, we see this. I did not see the temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Brothers and sisters, when we go to heaven, there is not going to be a temple because there is no need of a temple because the very presence of God it's our temple, it's our dwelling place, hallelujah. That is what we want to go. In the new heaven and the new earth, there is no physical temple because God's very presence is the temple. And Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 to 2 says, The angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great city the great street of the city. How wonderful. The river is going to be there because the river speaks about life, speaks about the presence of God. Did you remember when Jesus met with the Samaritan woman at the well? In those days, the Jews would never have anything to do with the Samaritan. They, thought, they think they're as out, outcasts. And yet Jesus approaches this woman who was at the well trying to draw water. Jesus asks for some water to drink from, from this Samaritan woman. And this woman said, why you ask from, from me? Thinking that, you know, you Jews think that, you, you know, you will never deal with the Samaritan and most of a woman. But Jesus said, you never know what you are talking about, what you are asking. If you know who I am, then you shall drink of the water that you will never thirst again. And so this woman was actually thirsty. He was the thirsty. He was drawing water every day. But yet it deep in her heart, in her soul, there was a yearning for that life-giving water. And here Jesus is providing that. 
Now we can only find this water in our Lord Jesus, who is the root, who is the source of the rivers of eternal life. And that's why Jesus says in John chapter 4, verses 13 to 14, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. This water from the Jacob's well. But whoever drinks of the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Wow, what a wonderful thing. That water that Jesus is going to give us, if we drink of this water, He said it will come within us like an eternal spring, welling up to eternal life. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, this is what Jesus is going to do in your life and my life. And some of you who are joining us this service, you have never known Jesus in your life. Can I recommend to you today, come to that Jesus who died for you on the cross and who ro rose again on the third day. And he says, I'm going to give you that living water to quench you of your thirst for eternity. And this water you can find welling up in you, give you that joy and purpose in your life. And this Jesus is going to come and dwell among you. Secondly, we can see that this river is unstoppable. And in verse 3 we read, As a man went eastward, again this is the angelic being, with a measuring line in his hand, and he measured off a thousand cubits. A thousand cubits is just roughly just over half a kilometer, 500 meters. And then they led me through water that was ankle deep. And he measured off another thousand cubits, another half a kilometer, and he led me through knee deep. And he measured off another thousand and led me through the water that was to the waist. And then he measured off another thousand, but now it was like a river and the water is overwhelming. They said, I could not cross because the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim. That means over four feet. A river that has no one could cross. And he asked me, son of man, do you see this? And so we find that here, Ezekiel was given that vision of the rising or the deepening of, of the river. And also the river get deeper and wider. And so we see that this river from the temple flowing eastward. And the angel leads Ezekiel to follow the stream as, as it flows towards the east. At the first stage, you see, it was only ankle deep. And Ezekiel was able to walk through this water. And the second stage, he measured another 1,000 cubits, another 530 meters, and led him to knee deep. And another stage, the third stage, leads him to waist deep. And finally, the fourth stage, which is roughly about two kilometers away, he sees he was so deep, flat over his head, that he cannot pass through. And what was surprising we see here, you know, a rapid increase in the, the depth and the streams. And normally you don't see this kind of phenomena. Now if the source is so small, how can you go to it? Normally you have a, a large source of river, then it goes into different distributaries. But here is the reverse. Here, we see the water ticking down, but as it goes out, it opens up, and more water is coming through, and it floods people. So, a tiny streams, and now can be expanded, and, and even advancing into the Dead Sea, as we're going to see later. So, in this vision, what was initially a small trickle up from the century, the temple, like water flowing out from a bottle, and it miraculously transformed into a powerful reaper that, with a span of uh, roughly about two kilometers. And this evidence shows what? The very power of God, the very origin, the source of the omnipotent God who can transform things. Now, after this, we find Ezekiel was then brought back into the river bank, and he saw many trees growing along both sides of the river. And as it flows its words, the, the desert that time becomes vibrant. And we see trees were sprouting, and we see there was a huge and beautiful flourishing landscape in, 
just like the landscape you see in the Garden of Eden. Eventually, it will empty into the Dead Sea. As it enters, it will transform that salty water and bringing life once again. Everything comes to life in the Dead Sea. And in verse 8, God asks, do you see this? And I believe this question is also applicable to us this morning. Do you see this? Do you see the transformation power of God that is taking place, that is moving in our generation and this time? Do you see the life that God is going to bring about into our nation, into our communities? And that's what God is speaking to Ezekiel at that time. So this vision speaks about the new creation that is coming. The new creation that God has want to restore into the lives of the communities and the people that has been drawn and, and been in bondage. God wants to set them free and give them that life once again. And this is not a vision for the future only, but it's already been realized today through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you and I have been called to bring the gospel of hope into our nation, into our communities. When God's people are moved by the Spirit of God, they give of themselves, seemingly like trinkle of water, but you see what the power of Spirit can do. He can multiply them, just as this river opens up, it's going to bring the great power of God and do great and mighty works for God. You know, God can use ordinary people like you and me to do extraordinary great exploits for him. Would you say amen to that? God can use you and I to do something because it is unstoppable. And so the river that started from the temple that trickles with water has become a powerful river. The river that flows from the altar of our Lord Jesus Christ, from the very cross that our Lord Jesus died. And when he rose again, he gave the promise of the Holy Spirit. And that was the very essence of what the Lord Jesus did as we read in the book of Acts. And throughout the gospel and throughout the history of the church, the power of God is moving across the nation and throughout the generations. And he's continued the act of grace even today until Jesus comes again. And this river is very, very power of God. And this river speaks about the mercy of God. His mercy flows like a river. It's unending. It's unchanging and which is powerful enough to redeem whoever will put their trust and belief in our Lord Jesus Christ. And fundamentally, we see that miracles that are going to happen. The real river in the real messianic kingdom that is going to come. And this is a powerful picture of how God can use us and increasingly in our progress, in our depth of our own spiritual life. You see, in this vision of Ezekiel walking through ankle deep to knee deep to waist deep to the depths where we can no longer touch the ground and that we must then swim. It speaks about the flow of the Spirit of God that God wants to move you and I to expand in our walk with Him and our understanding of Him, our knowledge of Him, that we are able to see the very presence and the power of God moving in our generation. And this is what God wants you to do. So God's people must read this and feel that there is a call of God for us to go deeper. And it is by trust that we go there. Even when we cannot hold on, we can no longer walk, we must learn to swim. Allow the Spirit of God to carry us along in His currents and He's comfortable to the place He wants us to be. Many of us are afraid of water. But I trust you that you can put your trust today by walking through first the first step. Your water may be ankle deep. Try it. And when you are able to walk through the ankle deep water, God's going to show you the next step. And ultimately, God wants you to swim with strong, with power, with Him, because He's going to carry you through. Remember the God that can bring the people out of Israel, uh, out of Egypt, into the promised land. The God can part waters from the Red Sea. He's the same God that can make you swim in whatever situation that you are now in. Thirdly, we see it's the river that transforms. Let's read verses, second part of verse 6 to 11. Then he led me back to the bank of the river. And when I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. 
And he said to me, this water flows towards eastern region and goes down to the Arabah, the Arabah desert, east side of Jerusalem, and where it enters into the Dead Sea. And when it empties into the sea, the salty water became fresh. And verse 9 says, swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. And there will be a large number of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. And so where the river flows, everything will live. And verse 10 says, Fishermen will stand along the shore and from En Gedi and to En Glim, and there will be places for the spreading nets. The fish will be many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. But the swamps and the marshes will, become, will not become fresh because it will be left for salt. So God has his plan. There's one part that he said it will be kept for salt. We still need salt in those days. You know, here we see the Red, the Dead Sea. Why it was called that? Because it was salty. You know, the Dead Sea is the lowest point of the earth. And it's something like 1,300 feet below sea level. You know, Dead is called a Dead Sea because of the very high salt content, more than 25%. And because of that, no fish or any marine life can survive. And, and some of us who have the privilege of visiting the Holy Land uh, several years ago, uh, we had the privilege to swim in, in the Dead Sea. Uh, we can float literally because of the, uh, because of the saltiness of, of, of the sea, the high mineral content that will enable your body to float easily. But as the water from the temple flows into the Dead Sea in this vision, this toxic water is transformed. It's become fresh. And it's now filled with swarms of living creatures because of the water from God that brings about restoration and healing into the water. What a wonderful picture we see here. And verse 9, swarms of living creatures will, will live and wherever the river flows. And this transformation illustrates the very power of God a life-giving presence of God that can heal and transform and restore. Brothers and sisters, you know that when the Spirit of God comes into your life, whatever that was barren can become fruitful. Whatever emptiness that you may experience, He is going to fill you. The dry land becomes a very well irrigated watered land they will be refreshing those who are wounded those who are hurt can be healed even the dead can become life you know brothers and sisters the water that's refreshing can come into the very depth of the dead sea the lowest depression on earth the lowest point on earth what does this speak to us it speaks about the grace of God. That despite whatever situation we may be, whatever low point that you may be, God can reach down to the deepest place of our own despair, our bitterness, our hurts. If only we can just come and humble ourselves and acknowledge Him. And this is give us hope in the, our broken world, in our broken society today. God is calling Christians, God is calling the church to be the channel of that river of life, to offer hope, to offer life, not to teach about good and bad, but to offer that life, that relationship with the Almighty God. That's what you and I are to do, to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that relationship, it can anchor you you will not be shaken or moved because of anything that's happening to you. Even pandemic, even disasters can never shake you because God is the anchor of your life. And finally, brothers and sisters, not only we see the source of our life, we see the very power of this river, we see the transformation of this river, we see this river will bring joy, bring life. Ezekiel 47 verse 12 says, Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. 
and their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit, because the water from the sanctuary flows to them, and their fruit will serve for food, and their leaves for healing. Now on the banks of this river, Ezekiel saw trees that will never wither. They will never stop producing fruit. Every month there is something fresh coming out. I love to have this kind of garden. I love to have this kind of orchard that will continue. We don't have to wait for season. Every month, something is going to be fresh. So verse 12 tells us, the fruit from these trees will feed the people, provide sustenance and whatever that they need, and also provide healing because the leaves will bring healing to them. And we see here a beautiful image of what paradise is all about. And that's why God created the Garden of Eden for, for, for Adam and Eve before they fall. They can enjoy everything that God has provided. Food, you know, if they're wounded, you can just take the leaves and rub on it, you get healed. And that's what God wants each one of us to know in Him there is sustenance of life. He's our provider. We can only trust Him. And He can bring healing to our soul. You believe that God can heal you? You believe that God can touch you today? And I promise you, He will. So this picture looks back to Garden of Eden, as we see in, in Genesis 2. And it also helps us to look forward to the new creation in the future in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. So the trees here are like trees of life. Perfect for our redemption. We see our world that is being damaged by our human lifestyle. We see the ecological damage of our environment. Today we talk about climate change agenda. But God is going to bring about that redemption. In this world we see so much pain and sorrow. But in the new creation, all the broken relationships, all the wounds will be healed, will be mended. And whatever pain that we have, God say, I'm going to heal. And today, and this is a message of hope that we will have. It's a message full of life and joy that we can enjoy. And what makes this possible and is found in this verse 12, it's because of the water from the sanctuary that flows to them. So long we allow this water of life to flow through us, there will be a continuous enjoyment of life, of, of joy. Because the very presence of God that this river speaks about brings that life, brings that joy into your life, into my life, into the life of our neighborhood, our community, and into our nation as well. Yes, we are in the election year now. Let's pray that God's very presence, this river of life will flow across our nation touching every life, bringing restoration and healing to our nation once again. And this is the place that we belong. This is the place that we want to be, where the presence of God is. And that's why in Revelation chapter 22, the angel showed me a river of the water of life. You see this again? The river of the water of life. As clear as crystal flowing through the throne of God, and of the Lamb, and down in the middle of the great street of the city, and on each side of the river stood trees of life, bearing twelve crops of the fruit, yielding its fruits every month. And the leaves of the trees are for healing of the nations. Wow, this is a beautiful picture of what's going to come. Yes, in the new city of Jerusalem, there's no longer the need for a temple because the very presence of God but there is going to be a river of life flowing through, bringing about life and joy into the lives of its residents. My concluding thought for you today, brothers and sisters, is, uh, is this. Are you going through a difficult stage in your life? Dryness, hurts, and that you are yearning for the Lord to quench that thirst for healing, for salvation are there dryness or bitterness in your life when there's no river flowing you see 
is drought is happening in your life. Drought is within you. But the good news is, today God wants to give you that living water, His abundant life, and His blessings. He wants to restore that once again because He has promised to do from creation, from the very beginning, and through all the generations. And when we thought that sin can break all this, He brought His Son to bring about the renewed blessings of God, the new life of God into us again. Jesus promises in John chapter 7, verse 38, Whoever believes in me, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Wow! All we need to do is simple trust, humble ourselves. We must tell God, oh, we have tried all our ways. We have tried all the human wisdom. And we can never achieve what we wanted to be. We never find that kind of satisfaction. But today, when we put our trust in God, He says, whoever believes in me, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And God is giving us the Holy Spirit to confirm His very presence in our life. Wherever we go, He is with us. Once again, the question, are you thirsty? Are you thirsting for the Spirit of God? If you are, come to the river. Come to that source who is the Lord Jesus Himself. The very mercy of God from His throne of grace is flowing like a rushing river. And His very presence of God brings healing, sanctification, and fulfillment into our lives. The church is being called to share this wonderful news, the gospel. When the good news is being accepted and received, everything will live. While living on earth, we struggle with all our brokenness, but we have hope in the new creation, our eternal home. May the Spirit of God flow over and flood over our lives, over our families, over our church, over our communities, our cities, and our nation. We pray that God will bless our nation with this river that will come straight from the sanctuary of God, from where the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ is, where He died for us, and from the very place that He rose again from the grave, and the promise that He's going to come once again to bring about that redemption, the ultimate salvation that we all look forward to. Let us pray together, brothers and sisters. Let us pray. Wherever you are, just lift your hands to God this morning and pray this prayer. O Lord, Almighty God, we thank you that you are the source of our life. We acknowledge that in our struggle over our own life, in our own circumstances, we are thirsting. We are drying up. And therefore, we come and then ask you to come into our lives again. And Lord, we acknowledge we need you as our Lord, our Saviour. We want to acknowledge that you are the source of that living water. And we want to invite you to come deep into our hearts, into our life once again. We pray, Lord, that you would manifest your power, the power of transformation, the power of life, the power of giving meaning and purpose and joy and fulfillment into our life once again. May we honour you. May we give you glory in all that we do. Father in heaven, I pray that whoever who is out there this morning, that your blessings will be upon them. Lord, you will lift them up. And in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Flood over them, Lord, with your very presence. Just as you showed Ezekiel, Lord, the, the depth of the water, the expanse of the water that overwhelmed him. May they be carried by, Lord, by your very presence itself, the currents of your, the water that you're going to take them wherever, elevate them to the place that you want them to be. So, Lord, may the blessings of the Almighty God 
and the love of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of my brothers and sisters and our friends out there. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to leave you with some question for you to ponder. If you're in the cell group, you can bring this and discuss among yourself. In the passage that we read this morning, particularly verses 6 to 12, ask ourselves, where would this river flow? Where is it from? And what blessings does this water from the very temple bring to where it flows to, ultimately to the very depth of the, of, of the Dead Sea? What is the significance of that verse, with verse 12, verse 9, we say where the river flows, everything will live. What is the meaning of the trees on either side of the river that bears fruit every month? And we compare that to, to Genesis chapter 2 as well. The second question is that what are the implications of this passage for my life today? What was the most important thing about Ezekiel's vision that is that meant for me today? So I leave you with this question and have a fruitful week ahead of you and God bless you wherever you are. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elder Dr. Ong Silian, for the timely word this morning. We hope that everyone was blessed by the word this morning. And a quick reminder that if you are not subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, do remember to press on that subscribe button so that you'll get the latest updates on what's happening in our church, as well as our morning devotions, prayers, and so forth. So we just want to thank all of you for joining us today. May the Lord's presence go with us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you and have a fantastic week ahead.